So what you have here then is a probability density plot. So the kernel density estimate, the smooth histogram is the dark line and the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve is the dashed line. So we've seen examples before of the normal distribution curve in the first few lectures. Now you have to sort of squint a lot in order to sort of see this, but if you've got your x-ray glasses on, what you should see is the dashed line falls below the solid line. And what this is indicating is that there is a higher probability of extreme events in this financial data compared to the normal distribution. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you've got the probability of extreme losses. And on the right-hand side, you've got the probability of extreme gains. And in both cases, the normal distribution model underestimates these probabilities. Okay, so this is an early example of the actual market data is <coughs> more risky than the mathematical model used to describe it. Okay, and this will be true time and time again. The market that you look at will be more risky than any model used to temporarily describe that. So it turns out it's a bit easier to sort of see what's going on if you look at the log of the probability density instead. So if you look at the R commands used on slide 4.14, you just need to instead have uh, the log of the dens dollar x and log of the dens dollar y and the log of the denorm value. Everything else stays the same. And in this case, what you have is that the dashed line for the normal distribution is significantly below the solid line for the kernel density estimate, the smooth histogram. So what you have in this case then is again, the normal distribution underestimates the probability of extreme events. And on the left hand side, what you have is the probability of extreme market losses. And on the right hand side, what you have is the probability of extreme market gains. Probably the most important thing here to focus on is the probability of extreme losses and this is going to be i think a, a general theme to be aware of here that any market you look at will show riskier behavior and be more dangerous than any mathematical model used to temporarily describe that okay and if you look at the left hand side what you see here is this normal distribution underestimates the probability of extreme losses on this market so another stylized empirical fact is that the log returns are approximately uncorrelated. So if this stylized empirical fact is true, then the autocorrelation function plot constructed should have all the points or nearly all the points within the tram lines. Although, as we'll discuss below, there is some sort of margin for error in terms of how you qualitatively interpret this figure. So in R, the function you need is ACF. ACF stands for autocorrelation function. And you would just apply this function ACF to the time series of log returns. Now, if you look at the graph constructed, what you're looking for here is all these values to be within the tram lines for each lag. Now, within that, there's a certain amount of random error. So I suppose really what you're really looking for is it's okay if some of the lags are sort of poking their heads outside the tram lines but you'd expect these to be the higher order lags, not the low order lags. So really you'd, you'd expect to see no lags significant, say the first five or seven lags and relatively few lags significant in the first 10 lags. So perhaps this thing is not holding absolutely co completely, but there's very little suggestion from this of an obvious autocorrelation in the log spin series. If you look at the absolute values of the log returns, then you do get quite significant autocorrelations. This is usually interpreted as saying the log returns are approximately uncorrelated but are not independent. And this can be quite a difficult thing to distinguish. So the log returns are not independent, and this feature is 
sometimes also described as long range dependence and volatility. So how you would demonstrate this is if you look at the autocollation function of the absolute value or modulus of the log returns, then these are very clearly outside the tram lines of this autocollation plot. Okay, so the clear suggestion in this case is that there is significant autocollation. The R code you need to do this is ACF of the absolute value of the log return. So ABS ABS is the R code for the absolute value or modulus. And then you need to apply the ACF function to this series of the absolute value of the log returns. Okay, so that should explain there the ordering of the brackets within the R code used on this slide. So clear suggestion here of autocollation precisely because all these things are outside the drum lines. But we'll discuss volatility clustering and arch gauge modeling to account for this in the next lecture. Now one thing I want to sort of emphasize here is that these arch gauge models just give you an imperfect way of describing the behavior that occurs on these financial markets. Financial markets will be inherently more risky than these mathematical models will suggest. So arch gauge models give you a formal statistical test and a way of accounting for volatility clustering, but there are some important points to bear in mind here. So firstly, purely graphical measures of volatility clustering are still useful. And again, I think this is a, something of enduring value to always look for two pieces of information that tell you the same thing. In this case, statistical information and purely graphical information. Also, as I was trying to say earlier, the behavior of price volatility will be richer and inevitably more dangerous than any mathematical or statistical model can describe. Okay, so necessarily what happens here is that the arch gauge models give you some description of some of the patterns in volatility that occur, but inevitably volatility is richer than these arch gauge models can possibly describe. So in order to graphically illustrate volatility clustering, what we have here is a time series plot of the log return series for the Bitcoin data. Now the R code to produce this plot is discussed in a couple of slides time. What I wanted to sort of go through here is just to sort of show you what you're looking for here. So what you're seeing is something that's qualitatively very different compared to a simulation from a normally distributed random walk. And what you get is that the prices clump together around large spikes in volatility. Okay, and this is inevitably much richer and also much riskier behavior than the random walk model can possibly describe. So this way in which the graph appears to sort of cluster in these big spikes is the reason for the name volatility clustering. Okay, and then the other thing to sort of watch for here is the scale on the y-axis, which will be much bigger for these actual observed log return series than for the simulated data. So look here, the y-axis goes from minus 0.2 to plus 0.3, and this will be much larger than the y-axis for the simulated data. The question we've got here is simulated data from a normal random walk model with the same mean and standard deviation as the original Bitcoin data. And you can hopefully sort of see that this looks too smooth compared to the real observed price series. So you don't get the same clustering in volatility. Now, another thing to watch for here is the scale on the y-axis goes here from minus 0.1 to plus 0.15. So again, this emphasizes here that this simulated data isn't as rich and isn't as risky as the actual historically observed data. And this is just to sort of emphasize here that any mathematical model of prices here, Bitcoin prices will necessarily underplay the richness of the 
possible behaviour that can occur and the true extent of the price risks involved. So if you look at this graph with the graph on the previous slide, you've got obviously marked differences between the two. This looks more artificial precisely because it is not a very accurate representation of the sorts of behaviour that you can observe in real price series. Okay, so there's no volatility cluster here on the simulated data, but there is on the real market. So I just wanted to go through here the R code needed in order to produce these previous two plots. So in order to produce the time series plots, the actual command that you need is ts.plot, which just means time series plot, and this is applied to the log return series. So this is why if you look at the slide there, it says ts.plot applied to the log return series. Now, if you want to produce the same thing for a simulation from the normally distributed random walk model, you need to know three things here. Firstly, the length of the series, and you just need, in order to, to calculate this, just to say length of log return, and this will calculate the length. And then the mean of the series, again, this is just mean applied to the log return series, and then the standard deviation of the series, this is the function SD that you need in R in order to accomplish this. And then a plot of the simulated data can be constructed using the ts.plot command applied to a simulation of the data, and this is what the thing in the brackets is. So what you have here is R norm, so the length of the series, 2481, the mean and then the standard deviation and what we've done there is just adding a sensible looking Y label so you can see what the graph is actually intended to show people. A further stylized empirical fact is this central limit theorem effect. So a typical finding here is that as the return horizon increases, the returns I should say, I beg your pardon, should become closer and closer to a normal distribution. So as the return horizon increases, there's essentially a smoothing effect that's going on. So some simple examples about how this effect should manifest itself include returns calculated over a day should be closer to a normal distribution than returns calculated every 15 minutes. Returns calculated over a week should be closer to a normal distribution than returns calculated over a day. And again, just to re-emphasize here, what is happening is that as the return horizon increases, there's a smoothing effect that's going on, and as part of this, the returns calculated over longer time horizons should get closer and closer to a normal distribution. So as part of this then, returns calculated over a month should be closer to a normal distribution than returns calculated over a week. And by extension, returns calculated over a year should be closer to a normal distribution than returns calculated over a month. So Hopefully this is not sort of too much of an ordeal. These aren't necessarily easy concepts, but they have made for quite nice dissertation topics in the past if you ask people to investigate how well these stylized in purple. So I just wanted to sort of quickly run through the references in the slides then. So we've got the first reference here, Carl 2001, a three-star paper discussing these empirical properties of asset returns and these stylized empirical facts. Another three-star paper here, Katsuyama 2017, what I wanted to emphasize here is that aspects of this lecture are surprisingly co close to topics that would be considered cutting edge research topics in finance and economics. The book by Kanton Tankov is a serious mathematics book financial modeling with jump processes so it's a serious maths book although despite the heavy level of maths in here it is a very applied text certainly a book i've benefited from reading from a lot and then the book by weatherall 2013 this is a essentially a popular science book this is related to things that made me get interested in finance in the first place and this is an interesting discussion of various attempts by different physicists to model financial data okay and as i said before this specific thing is what got me interested in finance 
in the first place.